Welcome to Swartz Shorts, the podcast all about the entrepreneurial ecosystem at Carnegie Mellon University and the larger Pittsburgh community. Welcome back, everyone, to Swartz Shorts. Today, we are thrilled to be joined by Matt Spatel. Matt gained his degree from Carnegie Mellon University and, while he was there, launched his company, Copilot. Now, having just raised a successful Series A, Copilot is a one-on-one fitness coaching experience that pairs individuals with a dedicated coach to form lasting lifestyle changes. Matt, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much, Rob. Super excited to be here. It's great. So, Matt, before we dive in and, you know, Pat gets into kind of the nitty gritty of what's going on with Copilot right now, we like to kind of go back in time before Copilot existed and, you know, ask you a few questions on, you know, your motivations to get you to this point in uh, in your life. So tell us a little bit about, you know, life before Copilot. Yeah, great one. So I I always start off by saying that I was that guy back in middle school who was making his own video games and trying to sell them to people. Uh, that that generally gets us off in the right uh, the right context and frame of mind. <laughs> that you know I, I took that energy with me through you know obviously my time finishing up the initial education and then going off to Carnegie Mellon to really dive more into the the technical side and the entrepreneurial side. And along that journey, there were you know at least three or four projects that I. You know, we're sort of, I guess, student startups or project startups, whatever you want to call them, but little companies I built, you know, not that I thought that they were, you know, <laughs> sort of not real companies at the time, but, you know, <laughs> getting the reps in uh, to use a fitness analogy with building a company and getting ideating and finding customer, uh, you know, so cu- initial customer fit and doing customer discovery and things like that. Um, so I was always building random things, mostly to solve little pain points or, or major pain points in my own life. I was one of those people where if I, one example is I was frustrated with, I hated chemistry class in high school, worst thing ever, I hated measuring things, doing titration solutions. So what else would you do other than build a robot to just do all that for you, right? So that, that was my mindset attacking most of the, you know, sort of problems that came up uh, in my day-to-day life. And that was sort of the same mindset that obviously as we'll get into eventually led to Copilot. It's amazing. I mean, I know that I was building robots to, you know, solve for titration as well in high school. You know, that's that's what everybody (laughs) did, right? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So, so, so Matt, go as far as saying I was a little bit nerdy, but <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. Hey, we, we all had our vices back then. So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So Matt, uh, you know, once you got to Carnegie Mellon, you know, you started your, your undergraduate degree there. Um, you kind of said things started with an interest in video games and, you know, maybe it was building robots, but inevitably what, what led you to fitness? That is a, that is a great one and totally tangential from this sort of like problem solution type mindset. I was actually at a, for lack of better words, nerdy summer camp, uh, in high school studying engineering, like classic nerd stuff. And, you know, I distinctly remember that on like the third day of this program, you know, we're doing whatever calculus on some whiteboard. And then this like very fit, you know, beefy guy walks in and we all kind of look over and we're like, what the hell is this guy doing here? Like, this is a nerd camp. Like, why is a jock here? Right. And turns out that would, that guy was Gabe Madonna, my now sort of best friend and co-founder uh, at Copilot. Um, but that initial sort of bond we had was actually around fitness of all things, because I was very competitive. I love sort of feeding off of things other people were passionate about and just jumping into it and having fun doing that stuff. And so Gabe, of course, sort of brings me into the gym, brings me into athletics a bit, completely kicks my ass at everything. And that was the awesome foundation uh, for a friendship between us where, you know, we would, we would strive to always be like beating each other and things. And he would be more on the sports side and I would be more on the, you know, aesthetics sort of, you know, bodybuilding side of things. And we just had an awesome uh, companionship there. And I, it's very, you know, fitting that I would very much describe Gabe as like my coach, my trainer back in those initial days when he brought me into that whole world. And I built so much self-confidence and, you know, yes, like my body itself changed, but more so just my, my image of myself and sort of my energy and, you know, my mental health as well, all flourished because of that exercise. And so many, many years later, uh, when we were, let's see, juniors or going into our junior years at at CMU for me, MIT for Gabe, we were 
of course, thinking of random little ideas and gadgets we could build for this shared passion we had around fitness. And we were, we were interested in this concept of, man, these wearable devices are really good at tracking steps and calories and heart rate, but they don't track anything we care about, which was, you know, reps and weight and um, form and pacing and time under tension and these more like tactical strength training things. And so that was the initial, that was how the passion led into the very initial, very data-driven technical ideation that again would sort of lead us down that road to co-pilot. It's amazing. Really cool. Really cool. Now, Matt, you just raised a, a series A. So first of all, congratulations. That's, that's an you. awesome milestone. Fantastic. Tell us a little bit about that journey, you know, for, for our audience of CMU students, CMU alums and, and supporters, a series A like you raised is, is really a, a goal for, for future entrepreneurs. Take us through the journey of, of going through that raise and then what some of your plans are to, uh, to, to conquer the world with the, the capital that you were able to raise. Yeah, great question. Uh, so, I mean, first of all, I would say the, the most important, you know, thing that we had to get in place before we could go raise XX million dollars from investors was, you know, the fundamental question that I always encourage, um, especially entrepreneurs who are still at CMU or at, at a university to focus on is the question of just fundamental product market fit. And it, you know, we did not find that overnight, you know, the, the techie tracking driven service that I just described was very much not the actual product that we found product market fit with. And it was only because we were willing to pivot and iterate over the course of, it was about a year and a half of kind of wandering around in the dark, for lack of better words, sort of testing out what do people actually care about. And it was only when we came across this concept of, well, it's not what you do in, in fitness or exercise that really matters. It's, are you even doing it? You know, the only workout that matters is the one that you'll actually do in other words, right? And so we shifted everything towards adding real humans to the system, real human personal trainers and coaches and focusing on providing accountability and support and building habits. And it was only after doing that and iterating on that sort of dynamic and relationship and product that we were able to finally crack that initial wall of, wow, people actually wanna pay for this. And more importantly, they wanna stay and keep paying for it for a very long period of time. And it was only then when we had that kernel of, of legitimacy and kernel of um, opportunity that we could go and successfully raise money from venture capitalists. You know, we raised a few hundred thousand dollars from competitions and grants and like these awesome programs through CMU that I'm sure you've heard again and again from the people <laughs> on this uh, podcast, which is awesome. Super thankful for those resources. But it was only once we had that initial validation, especially as young first time founders in a very crowded market that we could go and actually raise that capital. And so, you know, over, obviously over both from our seed at the very, very beginning of 2021, and then our series A at the very, very end of 2021 announced at the beginning of 2022, um, we raised, you know, about $10 million. And that was that money. I always tell people is, is not my objective. It is not co-pilot's objective. It was simply, the amount of money we needed to move to the next sort of set of, the next level of impact, which we aspired to have, where whenever I hear, you know, normally it's a student or inexperienced, you know, an early, early, early stage founder who sort of says something along those lines of, oh man, like you raised a series A, like that's so awesome. Congratulations. I'm like, well, yeah, that's great. But like, let me tell you about the thousands of clients whose lives we've changed too. Right. And like, because the thing people don't realize is, Sure, it feels great to put an announcement of raising $10 million onto LinkedIn and have a few hundred people react to it. And you're like, oh, wow, I'm so successful and special. And like, yeah, like I'm going to be on the podcast or something, right? <laughs> but at the end of the day, the next day you show up to your business, it's the same people, the same customers, the same problems. You just have normally it's just more time to do the exact same thing. Sometimes there's very specific situations where you can add money, you can add money to add people, add money to add marketing spend, but it really just comes down to the same exact situation with a little bit more time and flexibility, right? And so if your foundation isn't rock solid when you go and raise money, then there's really no reason to raise money because it's not going to solve any of your problems. It's It will make your life exponentially harder the more money you raise. Uh, so you better be ready for that. You better have a good reason to raise, not just raising so you can post it on LinkedIn. 
Matt, I got to say, you know, I think you're a great example of why we like to found companies here in Pittsburgh. Gritty and realistic. That was a that was a great take. We appreciate it. Very much so. Thank you. Very much so. Along those lines, how did being in Pittsburgh affect your race to, to the positive or negative? I noticed when you're saying the challenges, you know, that, that you faced when you were raising, you said young, first time entrepreneur, crowded space. You didn't say anything about being in Pittsburgh or, or not being in the Bay. Yeah, I would say, I mean, we are very fortunate to have a huge geographic spread of our investors. Um, you know, specifically, it was really interesting that our entire seed round was West Coast investors, essentially, with, you know, angels scattered around. And then the majority of new investors coming into our Series A was Midwest or East Coast investors. Um, and so I don't think you really should read into that too much. It just happened to be that's where the investors were that believed in us in that particular moment in time to do what we were telling them we were going to do. Um, but I did not feel a substantial difference in pitching a fund in Ohio or Chicago that was specialized in Midwest investment versus pitching a fund in LA or in SF. It's like the more traditional like Silicon Valley viewpoint, obviously, right? Like I think almost, I mean, obviously not every fund, but in my experience, most funds across the country are on that same page of they're willing to back young, inexperienced, first-time founders, right? You know, if you can convince them of the fundamentals of your business, right? I think, mm -hmm. you know, we obviously see the top 0.0001% headlines of maybe that founder raising a $100 million Series A, and we kind of, that stretches our expectations for what a normal round might look like. But in reality, like, and at least in my experience, the experience pitching of VC in LA was similar to Chicago, similar to Boston, similar to DC. They all have the same criteria. They all get convinced by the same things, worried by the same things, right? Risk tolerance, like, yes, generally might be lower in the Midwest and East Coast, but especially as you're getting to the, you know, Series A stage, it's just all about numbers, metrics, scalability. What's the plan, right? Um, so maybe that's why our seed was West Coast and our A was Midwest, but you know, I wouldn't read into it. Great. Matt, if I can ask you really quickly a little bit, you know, on the vision for Copilot and kind of specifically another question around Pittsburgh. So in Pittsburgh, you tend to find a lot of B2B, a lot of hardware, robotics, but, you know, though there is a, a pretty strong, you know, software component to what you're doing, of course, this is a consumer oriented business at the end of the day. You, you know, talked a little bit about your, your customers and these folks that their lives are being changed. You know, Pittsburgh isn't necessarily a traditional consumer city when it comes to building companies. Why did you decide to, to stay here to build this B2C business? Why didn't you go to, you know, a New York or an LA for something that might be a little bit more fitness oriented? Yeah, and I think my answer is kind of just uh, mirroring your question and saying that, you know, Copilot is not a traditional direct-to-consumer business where we quite literally in the customers that we resonate with and that we target and that we see the most sort of success and promise in are not the customers who are being targeted by, you know, the equinoxes of New York or the, the tempos and tonals and uh, futures of, of San Francisco and the general West Coast area, right? Our core customer, not that we don't have customers in metropolitan areas, but our core customer is the person who's not been spoken to or been sort of pushed aside by those brands. It's the customer who, you know, I mean, to put numbers to it, it always shocks people to hear that about 40% of our customers are overweight by BMI and about 35% of them are obese by BMI. And not that I at all encourage using BMI as a metric of any kind, but it is just obviously eye-opening that when you look at Peloton and Peloton's marketing, or you look at Mirror, Tonal, Tempo, Equinox, or you know, pick your company, right? Like you almost never are seeing people that are actually representative of the people who are walking around on the streets of a city like Pittsburgh. Or I would even argue the streets of a city like Dallas or Austin, like, you know, even larger metropolitan areas, people just don't look like Peloton instructors, right? Yeah. And that aspiration is extremely harmful right? If everyone feels this pressure to, oh, like, well, they're the biggest fitness company. So I guess that's what everyone's supposed to look like. And that's what everyone's supposed to aspire to. And everyone's supposed to want to have a $3,000 bike in your living room. And that's the way to work out now, I guess. It's like, no, no, no. Like 
working out for you could mean walking to your mailbox and back. It could mean going outside right now in Pittsburgh winter and shoveling your, your driveway, right? Um, and that is movement, that is health, that is a healthy habit you can build, right? And so this sort of contrarian stance we take of these companies are addressing, I like to say like they're making the fit fitter, <laughs> right? Instead of addressing the core problem of this nation. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, I love that. Uh, that reminds me of, of some Nike ad campaigns over the last you know few years that they're exactly on that point that everyone can be an athlete. Everyone can can be fit. Um, tell us, in, uh, you know, obviously this is a Carnegie Mellon podcast. How can we and, and our audience help you and, and help co-pilot as you uh, continue your explosive growth? Uh, I mean, I'd say first and foremost is the, the most selfish ask of try a co-pilot. <laughs> we have a 14-day uh, free trial, absolutely no risk, you know, get paired with a coach, get a free, you know, 45-minute onboarding call with them to learn all about the co-pilot approach and get to know each other and come up with that plan for building sustainable, you know, healthy habits, like Rob said at the very beginning. Um, I, the more tactical ask I would, I would have is around uh, hiring, as you alluded to as well, of, you know, one really core hire that we're looking to make coming out of the Series A raise is a is a is a new growth leader in our company, specifically you know a VP of growth type role. And we're very very excited to you know hopefully find someone from the Pittsburgh or general Midwest area. But we're we're open to hiring you know across the entire country as we are for all of our roles as we're you know pretty much fully remote today. So that's one that if anyone in the audience is listening and is looking for a new new jump to make into a fitness and wellness space and a growth role, like would love to talk to you. It's amazing. All right, Matt, the, the hardest hitting question of the day in your free time. What are you watching? What are you reading? What are you doing? <laughs> I am primarily chasing after a German shepherd puppy. <laughs> I, uh, you know, re recently, a few months ago, I, I've always wanted uh, my own dog. And so I finally took the leap, even while in the craziness of building a company to, to go to go get a puppy. And uh, it's been a blast to, to chase after her. But um, yeah, between that and, uh, you know, just the regular relaxation TV time, I do not have much, uh, much time left, uh, outside the company. So I, I get most of that relaxation from chasing after a dog in the middle of a snowstorm. <laughs> That's your fitness, right? Oh yeah. I mean, a hundred percent. Like she, she, she runs more than I do. So I got <laughs> I have a friend that just got a German Shepherd puppy and I, he said he walks her 10 miles a day. I don't uh, know if yeah, you're quite at that level. There is no that. amount you can walk that is enough. It, it, is, <laughs> it is unbounded. Yeah. <laughs> incredible. Incredible. Well, Matt, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, we really look forward to seeing the continued growth of Copilot. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. This is awesome. Excited to be on and uh, have a great one. Thanks, Matt.